I'm a little bit like Warren in that I meander. But, you know, every now and then there's something that there's a nugget, I think, hopefully. Um, I think you want to be a declarative leader instead of an explanatory leader. Part of why Trump won is he was declarative. Part of why Hillary lost is she was explanatory. And a lot of people are explanatory because they want to demonstrate, I've done my homework, but, but in this day and age, it's like the lady doth explain too much. Okay, got it. And, and declarative is people know what you stand for, what you'll stand up for, what you'll stand up against, and it can never be self-serving if you're a leader. So, uh, so a declarative thing that you could, you could be the decades guy. Yeah. You, you could say my declaration is that there's something special to learn and give back during every decade. And, and I'm here to help you maximize each decade. So at the end of your life, you don't have regrets. Yeah. That's so good. That's powerful. Yeah. And, 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 and if you can be declarative about that, so it's, so it, it's, it's like, a, you know, I've written a co-authored or written nine books and my first book was called get out of your own way. It was just, a. it was published in 1996 and, and, uh, uh and I've never had an imp whatever you call it. So I, I mean, I've never had a book tour for any of my books. You know, they were never, and they were kind of, they caught on by word of mouth. So my book just listens in 27 languages, but you know, there was no advertising, no book tours. I speak on it more around the world than America because Americans don't want to listen. They want to be listened to. I mean, yeah. it's just the way it is. Yeah. yeah, seek first to be understood instead of seek first to understand seems to be the approach a lot of us take. Exactly. And, you know, I've spoken in Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Moscow twice, the UK, Canada. Can't get arrested in America. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can find you there, right? Yeah. Nope. But if yeah. you can be declarative, it's a little bit yeah. like being compelling. Yeah, it is. But, but if your declaration, um, it's like when I'm, when I'm called in, to do conflict resolution or to intervene a family business. And I say ahead of time, I say, look, um, uh, I, I won't take on the assignment, uh, but you need to know that uh, when I'm in the room, nobody gets bullied. And uh, uh, and I will t I'll call a timeout as soon as I sense it. And everybody else can take 15 minutes and I'm going to talk to the person who's a, who's a little bit too adamant. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to find out what's that all about. In fact, there's something, uh, there's an article I wrote, which I, I'm hoping will be picked up by some, and I'll tell you what it is. It's because uh, it's, it, it's how I, uh, how I do mediation and conflict resolution. It's called Michelangelo mediation. Hmm. And Mike, when people ask Michelangelo, how'd you sculpt David? He said, I chipped away everything that wasn't. It wasn't David, exactly. So, so when I go into a conflict or a mediation, I say, uh, I'm going to chip away everything. Uh, there's a resol th there is an agreement or resolution to be had. Or if, or if there isn't, you'll litigate. You know, you'll just, you know, you just, you'll just, uh, arm up and see where that leads. And I'm here to chip away at anything that gets in the way of it. And I will tell you the things that I'm gonna be noticing. And I tell people this ahead of time. That's what I'm gonna give the article up. Is, is, and it's very simple. I would say to the uh, business, I'd say, uh, what are three things that need to be resolved but you can't ever even have a conversation without it leading to an argument? Let's find three things they need to be resolved. Time is wasting. They come up with it. And then I say, good, I'm go look, we have agreement on that. Isn't that good that we have agreement that you can't agree on those? Good. Yeah. And I said, would you also agree that when people are talking to or with each other, and I actually, I actually crystallized this from Cobas, that when people are talking to or with people, you can move towards a resolution. But as soon as someone talks over, at, or down to people, the movement stops and That's other the, people get defensive. 
Right. Defense mechanisms and, and, kick I, in. and I said, so simply what we're going to do is I'm going to say, let's go one by one. Let's pick something that needs to be resolved mm -hmm. and show me the way you need to talk about it to move towards it, which means to and with. And I'm very sensitive to this. At the first sign of someone talking over, at, or down, I'm going to go, time out, time out, time, time out. Okay, 15 minute break. And then I'll take that person aside and say, you know, what's going on behind that? Because uh, uh, you may have a good point, but you're alienating everyone. And then I will talk them down from DEF CON 1 to DEF CON 5. Yeah. I will coach them on how to make their pitch when they go back in. And I'll say, look, it's got to be fair and reasonable to all parties. And if one of the reasons you're being so adamant is because it's not fair and reasonable, you know, then uh, uh, you're not going, we need to make it fair and reasonable. And if you say you don't care at the end of our little conversation, then I'm going to go back in with you and say, guess what? The only way to resolve this is for everyone to agree with him or her. <laughs> right. You know, or you know, or we have someone who has the power to be an arbitrator for the whole thing to decide for everyone. You know, have them arbitrate. Yeah. You know, or or, or it's irresolvable, and you know, you know, and, uh, and that's where we are. Yes, yeah, the greatest the greatest characteristic of a great influencer is the ability to listen. That's why the book over your right shoulder just listen. I mean, I'm guessing I haven't read it yet, but I'm guessing that that's a big part of what you're talking about. Yeah, and and it's and. I'll share my latest thing because uh, uh, this is quickly becoming a podcast episode, as you know. <laughs> you can do whatever you want with it. So, yeah, so we'll, I spoke we'll in, so I spoke in Moscow, and I uh, I headlined with a fellow named Daniel Kahneman. He he uh, wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. He won the Nobel Prize, and they asked me because five of my books have done well in Russia. They've done okay in America, but they've done real well in Russia. You can be arrested the in last Russia. Time I, <laughs> what? And I don't speak Russian, but the last time I spoke, and this is what I'm in, trying to introduce to the world. So it's it's the step beyond just listen. And I'm calling it empathic curiosity. And what that means is, and this is what I said to the audience. I said, you're listening to me. And if I fire off a bunch of bullets, I mean, bullet points, not bu not American bullets. Yeah, um, not Cold War stuff, I'm, but yeah. Not Cold, and, yeah. and if I'm, uh, I said, you know, I'll give you a bunch of bullets because you're listening to me and you'll write them down and most of them won't work. And you'll say it'll work for him. He's an expert, but they won't work for you. But if I'm engaging, you'll give me your mind for, for an hour. And then, I, and then I switched my voice and they heard my tone. It was translated into Russian, but they could hear my tone. Right. And I said, but if instead of list, focusing on you listening to me and are having a transactional conversation, I focus on what you're listening for. And I get what you're listening for without you telling me. And I deliver on what you're listening for. You'll give me everything. And I said, here's what you're listening for, I think. Let me check it out with you. You want to get better measurable results because that's how you get a raise or a promotion. Is that true? Duh. Mm, yeah. You're listening for a way to get that that's less stressful because the way you're doing it now, you're all drinking too much, you're eating too much, you're people, it's not a good thing. Is that true? Duh. And what you're most listening for is that I can give you doable by you tactics where you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to be a psychologist, you don't have to buy a book because I haven't written this book yet. I probably never will. You don't have to take a course because I uh, haven't made the course. But what you're, if I can give you tactics that are immediately doable by you to get better results with less stress, will this have been worth the money you paid in a day of your time? And they went, oh, duh. Yeah. So empathic curiosity is if you can realize that whoever you're with is listening for something and merely being curious about it. So I've been giving presentations to accelerators, to startups that want to get funding. And I say, have you ever been in the position where you're with a investor 
and they smile and you think it's a yes, but it's not a yes. Because <laughs> investors don't smile. Yeah, exactly. They're smiling because they already know it's a no and they don't want to be rude. Yeah, they promise you 30 minutes and you've got 16 more to go. That's right. And they don't want to be rude and uh, or they've already decided in four minutes, this is a yeah. no. And they don't yeah, they want got to 26 no. minutes to go. Yeah, exactly. And, and so they're smiling. How many of you have been there? Yes. Yeah. And I say, so this is how you re-engage them. You have to practice it. But they've already, when they smile, they've already checked out. And so what you say to them is, uh, I'd, like, I'd like us to pause for a moment. And they're going to go, what? You just woke them up. And they're going to say, what? Yeah, I'd like us to pause. Because when we met, we were like this. You had money to invest. I had a business to invest in. Uh, and it's gone like this. And which means you were listening for, looking for something that you didn't hear. Exactly. And I did my best to make a deck and everything and anticipate what you wanted and everything and the numbers, but apparently it didn't work out. So we have a little time left. Could you please tell me what you were listening for? Because I actually might have it. It's just not something we thought to put in our deck. Yeah. What haven't you heard that you were looking for? Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so I'm trying to, part of my mission is to have people do that everywhere in their life with their with their spouses with their kids yeah, that's where i'm going in my mind is all the, yeah. the relationships outside of business that are going to be you know, you, know, you know as soon as it you know and i've trained hostage negotiators fbi and police so i know something about disarming people yeah. and so when people get agitated you can say hold on hold on hold on uh uh you know uh, i actually have a, i think a seven-step de-escalation training for police but my my problem is I'm an outlier. I mean, Warren Bennis was an outlier, but he was so prolific. He got he got to you know put his point of view and spin on everything. But he was Warren yeah. Bennis, professor, whatever. I'm not professor of anything. And it was routine to quote Warren Bennis. It was almost expected. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but but I think if if you sense anything, if you sense agitation, the other person, that's a grand opportunity to say, hold on, hold on what what. Mm -hmm. uh, we were heading down this road and now it's like this. So either I've said something or failed to say something that made the, it go like this. Yeah. Or I've done something or failed to do something. Can you tell me what that is? Ah, yeah. and, you, and you don't defend yourself. Ah, oh, now I get it. Wow, wow. I see it completely. When you listen, you can spot the nonverbal too, which is really going to tell you more than anything they're going to say out of their mouth. Yeah. Because if I'm so busy thinking about what I'm going to say next, like if I'm listening with the intent to respond versus listening with the intent to understand, that's where that's going to start to happen. You're going to see it. I'm going to feel it. Others in the room are going to see the disconnect. That, that's everything you've shared with me to this point has been noteworthy, literally, because I'm taking notes, not just noteworthy, really nice, but literally taking notes. Noteworthy. Well, well, and we're, we're we... listening for is, is changing my life. What you're saying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, if you can pause everywhere yeah. um, and what will happen is now I was I was able to guess that with the Russian audience. And that's true of any business audience. We want to get better results because that's and we want to do it with less stress because we're all not taking care of ourselves. And we want it to be something we can do where we don't we don't have the bandwidth in our brain to be able to uh, you know learn another thing. I mean we're, we're behind in everything else, but but, uh, uh, but you can do that with anyone. You can do that with uh, you know there's a frequent thing where often one spouse gives the other spouse advice and they don't want advice. They want to feel heard. Yeah, yeah. Because when they feel heard they relax and when they relax, they're able to think. But when they are given advice that they're not asking, they don't feel heard. Just listen was about how do you cause people to feel felt by you? Not just understood, but felt. Feel felt, oh, yeah, that's awesome. What, yeah. what, what drove you to write that? What was, the, what was the epiphany you woke up one day and said, this is a book? Well, I was a suicide specialist for 25 years. None of my patients killed themselves. And, uh, and there were there were multiple moments. Um, 
I'll give you a couple. We're recording this. You can use this if you want. So there, uh, there, there were a couple of moments. One is, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure if I was still in psychiatry training at UCLA or a little afterwards, but I was, I was called in to see a uh, patient and, and give orders that they have their arms and legs tied down and be given a major tranquilizer because they were pulling everything out. They were pulling out their IVs. They were pulling out, you know, they, they were on a respirator uh, and, and they had AIDS, but it was so, it had, AIDS had not been given a name yet. And when I got in there, this person's eyes were as big as saucers and he was going, ah, I said, what is it? Ah. And they said, he's just psychotic. We had to put his arms and legs down and please okay the tranquilizer. And he was just staring at me. And I said, what is it? And I put a pencil in his hand and I said, what is it? And he just scribbled and I couldn't read it. And I said, look, you've been pulling at your IVs. You're pulling at the respirator, you're kicking. We had to put your arms and legs down. We gave you a tranquilizer. And you know, when you calm down, we'll take everything off. So a day and a half later, uh, they paged me and they said, Mr. Smith told us to page you. So I go back into his room. They said, he's off the, he's off the respirator. He's off the restraints. And he's se seated in his bed. And I enter the room and he looks at me and he, and he says, pull up a chair. And he seats me with his eyes. Mm -hmm. And he just looked at me and he said, what I was trying to tell you is that a piece of the respirator tubing was broken and was stuck in my throat you do know that I will kill myself before I go through that again. Do you understand? Wow. And he just held on to my eyes and my eyes got kind of teary. And I said, I understand. I'm so sorry. So I realized that a lot of people are screaming out at us. And often when people are screaming out at us, they make us nervous. And when they make us nervous, we try to control our anxiety, which they experience as a barrier between us. And then there's another story which, which kind, of, kind of blows people away. Uh, there was a woman that one of my other mentors, a fellow named Ed Schneidman, he was to suicide what Warren Bennis was to leadership. And he was at UCLA when I was there and he would refer me all these still suicidal patients that needed to be discharged because they weren't acutely suicidal, but you can't keep them there forever. So I was seeing a woman named Nancy for six months and I didn't think I was getting anywhere. And uh, I was moonlighting at Metropolitan State Hospital, not far from me in Norwalk. And so sometimes you're up 24 hours when you're covering for doctors. And I came in on a Monday to see Nancy and she never made eye contact. She'd be like this. And I sat down with her sleep deprived and all the color in the room turned to black and white. So I'm looking at the room and Nancy's like this and the room is black and white. And I feel these chills go through me. And I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. And I did a neurologic exam on myself because I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a medical mm -hmm. doctor. So I'm yeah. going like this. Trust I'm me, I'm a doctor, like yeah. I'm going like this and I'm all there. So I thought I'm not having a stroke or a seizure. I think I'm looking at the world through her eyes, feeling what the world feels like. I'm giving that gift of empathy. So without, uh, because I was sleep deprived, I blurted this out. I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. Well, wow. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of the pain. And then I realized I just gave her permission. So I thought I was in big trouble. And she looked at me for the first time. And I thought she was going to say, thank you. I'm overdue. Cause she'd made multiple attempts before I started seeing her multiple hospitalization. And I said, what are you thinking? And she looked at me and she said, if you can really understand why uh, I have to kill myself to get out of the pain. Maybe I won't need to. You can help me through this pain. And then she smiled. And then I looked into her eyes and I said, here's what we're gonna do. 
because she was holding onto my eyes too, like Mr. Smith. Yeah. I said, I'm not going to give you treatments or anything unless you ask her because you've been through everything. And if I give you something and you don't do it and you come back, we have to get into another debate about why you didn't do it. And then we'll try something else. Would it be okay if I don't give you anything unless you ask for some treatment? And she looked at me with a look that said, keep talking. And, and then I looked into her eyes and I said, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to find you wherever you are. And I'm going to keep you company there as long as it takes. Because I just don't want you to be alone there. You have to go to where people are. We can't expect them to come to us. You talk about like a, a dementia patient. My father-in-law passed away a couple of years ago. And mm. He had pretty significant dementia. And now my mother-in-law is experiencing it a little bit as well. And we have two autistic grandsons that live in our mm. home with us. And mm. um, one of the things that my wife learned and that she's taught me is we have to go to where people are. We have to, you know, an autistic child or a, a elderly person with dementia or a suicidal person doesn't have the capability to snap out of it and come to me. If they could, they wouldn't be autistic or dementia or suicidal. We have to go to them. And that's what I'm hearing you say in different words. Yeah. There, there's a video I'd like you to go see. We don't have time for me to play it. If you look up Gladys Wilson, okay. Naomi File, F-E-I-L, to Russia with love. So I play this when I give presentations and I play this, one of my, one of my presentations in Russia was just me for six hours. So I played it and there's Russian subtitles, but you can see the English. You can see the English version. The English version has, I think, uh, 1.5 million views. My Russian subtitle one, you know, has I think a couple thousand, oh, no, maybe more, maybe 5,000 views. But what happened is Naomi File invented something called validation therapy. Mm -hmm. And you basically go where the other person is and she works with demented people. And there is a moment about 30 seconds from the end, it's about six minutes. So, and whenever I show it, you will get it. It's the, oh my God moment. And whenever I show it, even to Russians, anyone, their jaws drop. And you'll know the moment when you see it. And if you're touched by it, like I was, I fell in love with Naomi File. And this was, I think she did this many years ago. So I had her on my podcast. So if you look up Naomi File, my wake up call, wake up is one word. Uh, and and she, you could tell that she's getting old. And one of the things she shared with me to go along with what she was saying, she said, you know, these demented patients, uh, when they seem to be blithering, what's happening is they're just expressing all the stuff they kept inside for decades because they don't have the ability to inhibit it. So what you think is crazy stuff is just unfinished stuff from who knows where because they don't have the you know, the, the prefrontal cortical inhibitory thing. But, when, but if you watch the, uh, the video of her and Gladys Wilson and you listen to the podcast, uh, I mean, she's so endearing uh, when, I, when I interview her. But when she talks about that, I think, I think it will touch you deeply. Oh, I touch can't your wait. Life deeply. As soon as we're done here, and I'm not in any hurry for this conversation to end, but when it does, I'm going there. Have you seen this book, The Reason I Jump? I heard of it. No, tell me about that. I, I... It's, a, it's written by a Japanese young kid, at the time 12 years old, who has autism. <clears throat> and I know we're talking about a different topic, but it's similar. Um, and it's written, in his perspective, he, he spoke to his parents who could understand him. Most 12 year old, I have a nine year old grandson and a seven year old grandson, as I mentioned, who live here. And I can pretty well understand what they're saying because I've been with them their whole life. Um, a stranger walks in here and they may not understand it either. It's like being in Russia for a little while. <clears throat> Excuse me, you're going to start picking up. <clears throat> Let me take a drink of water here. So if I do put this as a podcast, so my audience knows I wasn't planning on a podcast today with this. So you know, that's my excuse. But yeah, this is this is even better. But in the book, each chapter is a 
behavior or characteristic of an autistic child, of this particular autistic child. No, they're not all the same, but a lot of the behaviors are. And in the first 50 pages, which is all I've read so far, um, what I've learned about my two grandsons that live here is off the charts. Why do I stim? Why do I run around the house? Why do I hit myself with a stick? Why do I say nothing when I, I say, hey, grandpa, and I say something and grandpa doesn't understand me and ask, hey, what are you saying, buddy? Why do I say nothing? It's because I don't remember. The, the brain can't say it twice. It says it once, but it doesn't remember what I just said. And so nothing isn't like, never mind, I don't want you to hear it, or I'm thinking twice about saying this to you. I honestly don't remember what I just said. And so there's just so much behavior that I'm learning just from the little bit that I've read in this book. And um, I, I keep going back. I, I've heard everything you've said, and I'm so glad you suggested that we record because I'm going to go back and re-listen to this again and again. And I will share all or excerpts of this with anybody that wants it, which I think will be everybody. But you're, what are you listening for? I just, I can't get off of that. I just, I know just, it's, it's, it's so, um, and, and I'll add to that. So in each of my books, I introduce terms. Uh, I, I've written two books during COVID. One's called Why Cope When You Can Heal. And I introduce the approach that I use with my suicidal patients, surgical empathy. Hmm. And the idea is um, uh, with my suicidal patients, what I realize is that death is compassionate to hopelessness that won't go away. So they feel felt by death. And so when you, and surgical empathy means if you, if they can feel felt by you as Nancy did, she let go of death as the only way out. And she grabbed on to the surgical empathy and she started to tear up with relief. Something I talk about in Just Listen that goes to your point. So what I introduced in Just Listen that you might find interesting is a term I call the mirror neuron gap. So mirror neurons are in our mind and they seem to be associated with imitation learning and empathy mm -hmm. and they seem to be dysfunctional with autism so autistic people cannot mirror other people right but what i talked about in just listen is the mirror neuron gap is when you are trying to connect with the world or when you care about the world and you feel the world doesn't care about you it widens the mirror neuron gap and what happens, and, and other things widen it, uh, such as sarcasm, uh, uh, people being critical of you, people laughing at you. And what happens is the when the mirror neuron gap widens, uh, you get a burst of high cortisol from the stress. The high cortisol triggers your amygdala, and your amygdala hijacks you away from being able to think and pushes you into reacting. And there are certain things that lessen the mirror neuron gap, uh, such as feeling felt. And I talk about one of the reasons we cry at tearjerker movies, like right from Field of Dreams to Silver Lining Playbook, two of my is, we, is we identify with the conflict between two people. And then when they're resolved at the end, we cry with relief because that's Feels what good. we want. Yeah. And the mirror neuron gap goes away. So what I would suggest with people working with uh, autistic uh, uh, people, autistic children, is I, I would not only say, what are you listening for? I'd say, what are you noticing? And one of the things that Warren Bennis taught me that he, that he lifted from Saul Bellow is he said, be a first class noticer. Mm. Because when you notice things, you're connected to it. When you look, watch, or see, you're an observer. I need another but, page. but if you were to say to if, if you would be able to say to them, what are you noticing that's grabbing your attention? And a lot of times what's happening with autistic individuals is they don't have the words for this, but what they're noticing is they can't connect to the world. They're actually communicating, but the world is not getting them. And the world is sometimes getting frustrated with them when from their point of view, I'm doing the best I can. I'm communicating on all cylinders and you're just not getting me. And then what happens is the rest of the world, you know, uh, assumes that this, it's all the autistic child 
when really what it is is the autistic child is agitated and is looking and noticing for something that mirrors him or her so that uh, so that when that mirroring happens, they can calm down. And I think by asking, what are you noticing? And just being curious. And you can even say yeah, to your grandkids, I couldn't help, I couldn't help notice that you that, that you're doing that thing with a stick. Tell me about that. Hmm. You're reading my mind. I'm writing this down. I wrote <clears throat> I wrote stick right before you said it. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you something in a minute. Well, I, I think, well. I think we're running out of time, but I'm yeah. sure this, this is the first of multiple conversations. So I we're not over. You're, I'm not through with you yet, Ed. No, I'm not through with you either. But just so you know, I haven't even started asking you the questions I really want to ask. Can I ask you two, though? Yeah. So you talked a little bit about suicide. We lost a pastor, a uh, close friend of ours, uh, 2018, I believe it was. He, uh, young father, three young boys, very, very in the media very very um the story got out around the world his wife now um has um written a book um you know, i'm not going to try to pull the title right now but she's doing wonderful things in the world of trying to help people understand how to not how to mask but how, how to listen for and maybe not her words but they will be soon or some some semblance of that do you believe um, from your experience that one of the things, and I think I know what you're going to say here, but I'm hoping you won't just say yes or no, and I get that you won't, um, that many people feel suicidal because they don't feel like anyone's listening? That's a, that was a deeper way to ask that question, but I'll just leave it there. It's, it's that and much more. I wrote a blog yeah. after Anthony Bourdain and mm -hmm. Kate... Uh, yeah, and that was the same timing within months of when our pastor. Yeah. Took and his life I wrote well. an art article called "Why People Kill Themselves." It's not depression. Yeah. And had five hundred thousand views in eight days. And what I talked about is, you know, because you know I was immersed in that world for many years. Is that there's many people that are depressed, lose a job, lose a marriage, that don't kill themselves. Yeah, it, it contributes, but. There's many who don't. And, but one of the things that I discovered, and that's what the article's about, and you might want to look up design thinking suicide prevention. Design thinking suicide prevention. So that article that got all the views, I turned it into a series, and I think there's eight or nine parts. And one of the parts is design thinking suicide prevention. I think I have a full article on that in Thrive Global. But what I said is, at the end, one of the things that nearly everybody who's suicidal feels is despair and if you break the word despair into d-e-s-p-a-i-r they feel unpaired 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 yeah. with wow. hope hope less help less power less worthless useless meaningless purposeless and when they all line up pointless i feel alone you hear those words and so they pair with death to take the pain away but when you can pair with them in the feelings, but again, a lot of times when you pair with them, and if you look up design thinking, suicide prevention, you'll find tips of, there's also a Thrive Global uh, article that I wrote on, I think how to, if you just look up my name, how to break through the suicidal people, but see what happens is the more they feel felt, the more they cry with relief. And if you don't understand they're crying with relief, you can get anxious and say, it'll be okay. So it's, it's a misconnect. Now, sometimes they're crying, you know, for ways that aren't relief, but what you're really trying to do, and that's why we call it surgical empathy, because you're going into an abscess and you're draining it by helping them feel felt where they feel all alone and unpaired. And so when you get to notice that they are crying as they're speaking, sometimes that relief uh, can help them. Uh, there's someone who's become a good friend. He lives in Marietta. His name is Jason Reed. Uh, his 14 year old son died by suicide three years ago. And he and I have been doing presentations to groups like EO, YPO, uh, 
We did EO Arizona. We're doing EO uh, Seattle in a month where he shares his story. And then I offer tips about here's how you get through to your kid if you're worried. And if you look up Teen Mental Health Webinar, there's a video in which he shows a nine minute gold cast video that he presented to, I think about a dozen male founders about how he felt it was his fault that his son killed himself. And he basically said, you know, we entrepreneurs, we give advice, we solve problems. We have vulnerability, we have failed businesses, but we never share that with our family because we're the men. And essentially what he was saying is when you have a kid who's locked inside emotionally and all you do is give advice, uh, they, they start smiling. They start smiling that they're fine when they're not. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but anyway, this is, this is to be continued because I got to yeah. run to something else. But but I hope that answered your question, sort of. Every.